Pathways to Harrow is a five-year project that commenced in 2012. Every year, five women present their own unique story, which encompasses their lives before and after moving to Harrow. This is a project that unearths stories which are otherwise barely known by the wider community and even by one's own neighbour. They are fascinating, authentic, humorous, touching and challenging. Situated on the entry roads that lead to Harrow, there is a sign that says Harrow Living History. And that's exactly what Pathways to Harrow is all about. Living history, celebrating these women's journeys. We hope this program may help bridge gaps between any barriers in communities, including cultural, ethnic and linguistically diverse members and promote tolerance and understanding. It is also envisaged we may promote and encourage the idea of relocating to a rural community such as Harrow and the benefits of making such a decision. Whenever France fell, I was in a car with my mother and grandmother and I had never seen my grandmother cry. And there, um, we were pulled up, you know, parked, and Granny was crying and I couldn't understand what it was all about. But because her family lived on Jersey Island, um, it meant that little island would be taken over by the Germans at which they were, and her house was used as German headquarters, and they put all sorts of uh, uh, the um, people that he had working for him, dug a, a trench and quickly put everything they could into that trench. And they had the butler and beadle, could you? find a better name. Beetle was out, you know, trying to organise the digging of the hole to put the, tre the treasures out of the house in. Um, while Mrs Beetle was dealing with my granny and there was all this jewellery. Imagine the panic from them. But I always thought that was quite fun. But it was nice that the, the local Jersey people brought back heaps of stuff that they managed to grab before those Germans came. Well, the siren was from the Wonthaggy coal mine and we lived at Kareen, which was about seven miles from Wonthaggy. And you could hear it from there. And that day the war ended, it sounded and it just kept going and going and going. And I remember Dad saying, the war's over. No more school today, you can all go home. When I was first asked earlier this year about being one of the five women in the second series of Pathways to Harrow, I thought, sure, you know, why not? But wondered what the hell I'd gotten myself into <laughs> when I realised I'd have to stand up and talk to a hall full of people. probably about 20, well, I went to the shooting school and I was about 26, so from 26 to 27, that was probably when like, I started to get regular regular work. So I think it was the challenge more so whether I could or whether I couldn't, um, whether I was able to, um, to actually do it first off, but actually do it as, as a job as well, yeah. But like I said, I think it was it sort of bred, bred in me, just being able to step up and just do, do something a little bit different, yeah. Having, like, to turn up every day, like, your body takes a while to adjust to that sort of 
stress, I guess. Um, and it was it wasn't easy. Um, it was very, very, very difficult um, for, for a little while. But once you work through that, that I suppose you call it that pain barrier, like of, of your body getting used to the, the strenuous work, like the heavy dragging and all that sort of thing. But it still it was just a struggle. I'd say, look, could could you give me a pen? Could you give me? And they said, no, no. And as it turned out, I was at uh, somebody's place and. They need to cut a mob of sheep out, so they put up what they call a hungry stand, and the owner sort of set me up down the end there, and said, where you go and what have you, and by the time I got home that night, he was on the phone and told the guy that um, where I was staying that, you know, she's got work that next week, and then it just sort of gradually followed, followed on from then. My mother always says to me, oh, you should be proud of your achievements, and I sort of think, well, I don't, oh, sorry, it's probably a bit... <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to know my mother to appreciate that. Um, and and I don't. Um, I'm just. I just consider myself an ordinary person who goes and does a job that I enjoy. I really do enjoy my job. I mean, every job's got its bad days, but I generally enjoy. Go to work and I enjoy my job, and I meet some fantastic people and work for some fantastic people. I mean, there's women that work who are plumbers and electricians and, you know, work in mining and stuff. Because you're in a male-dominated industry, it's, um, yeah, pr pretty tough at times. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Robbie, Robbie's been giving me a hell of a lot of crap today. Has he? I said, oh, I said, oh, about the makeup and all this sort of thing. And I said, yeah, yeah. I said, you'd have to dip me in a 44-gallon drum of that stuff. <laughs> I said, I can't wait till this is over, Rob, because by hell I'm going to give it to you. <laughs>'Cause I used to sneak them and I thought nobody was looking. <laughs> and my favourites were raspberry smiles and chocolate coated teddy bears. It was education department policy to send you to the nearest vacancy to your hometown, the nearest school vacancy. And my parents at that time were in Caston, uh, which is not far from here. So they sent me to Harrow. When I came to Harrow, I was the first time they'd had three teachers in Harrow but, and that was because the numbers had increased to over 70 and towards the end of my time in Harrow was when the school bus service arrived to Edenhoe and as a result of that the Harrow numbers dropped and the third teacher was no longer needed. I don't think they've ever had a third teacher since. The numbers have just kept dropping over the years. We had um, the Brown and Mitchell Transport Company in Harrow and there was trucks coming and going all the time and, and truckies and a lot of, uh, most of the farms had workers, not like today where we can't afford them. That's why the, most of the children would come into the Harrow school and I guess that's how the numbers increased. So yes, it was busy and it was, um, wool was good price how many bales of wool would buy a car in those days and and now it's just astronomical what you would need the equivalent of and the transport company I was talking about it moved or closed down moved to Melbourne actually um, so yeah poor little town went backwards this has been an interesting project causing me to review my life's journey and the events along the way I'm very much an onward and upward person, so when I was invited to participate in this volunteer event, I thought, sure, this will be fine. 
having cause to reflect and actually have to put everything in perspective, it made me realise just how much my life had to be a response to things that were going on around me, over which I personally had no control. I had my life in the UK. I belonged to the Brighton Ballet Company, junior member. I'd been selected as a gifted student from my school. I was going to art college part-time. And there'd sort of been mention of Australia a couple of years before, and, and luckily it went away. But this time it didn't. And right up until the last minute, I wasn't coming anyway because I got along really, really well with my maternal grandmother, who was a lovely lady. And at the last minute, she'd sold up and came over with us. So we ended up in a £10 POM scheme. I'm not a £10 POM. I come from overseas. I grew up in England. Um, I grew up with the aftermath of war with the bomb buildings, the rationing, uh, what is now realised to be post-traumatic stress disorder, which may have explained a lot of what was going on in my household, um, and a lot of social changes. And of course, between the First World War and the effects of the Second World War, all that upstairs, downstairs, social fabric of English life had disappeared. <laughs> so that was interesting in itself, and I guess that in a way, my way of doing that was getting away from the home situation by wandering across the downs, um, absorbing myself in school. I uh, also loved singing, so I was in the choir as well. I used to just roam with my dog Trixie you know, for hours and just watch the farmers, and I just really enjoyed it. Um, it's just where I prefer to be. Fortunately, I sort of had enough now to understand roughly what I was supposed to do when I actually got on a horse for the first time in my life. And I was put on this stock pony, this black stock pony, and I was told that if I could get this pony back out of the paddock, up the race, into the farmyard, into the stable, I could consider that I could ride. But I realise now, after handling so many horses, that that was what it was going to do, it was going to go back to the stable anyway. And I was quite proud of myself and I thought I could ride. And so um, I've been riding ever since. I think one of the burning issues for survival of small groups in the country is internet access, is mobile coverage. Because if you haven't got infrastructure that is the standard set by the cities of this country. How are you going to attract people to live out in these more remote regions? But I think people in this community do an absolutely sterling job. After another 12 months of phone calls and the odd weekend trip for me to Harrow or Heath to Euroa, I finally took the road to Harrow, Heath and Happiness. There's a number of people around town that, you know, put in to the community and everyone is willing to help out. And it's um, sort of what keeps Harrow going in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm striving to keep progressing and being proactive. Yeah. Mm. We're lucky enough to have a few key people in town that have got that I guess now is to come up with those ideas and put them in place. Not everyone can do that. <laughs> Just to keep the, the community and the town um, positive, you know, and, and have activities that people can attend to and getting people through town and in a small community, you know, or a township like Harry, you just can't sit still and not do anything because it just doesn't, won't survive, really. It just stands still and doesn't <laughs> go anywhere. So, yeah, so being proactive is really important. I guess living in a small community, it's just, and having, you know, close friends around and, and I just being, I enjoy just being, you know, part of the community on, on a number of committees um, around town and over at the school and, I mean, the Pathways is a classic example of what, um, you know, what an event can do for a town like Harrow, you know, getting a huge amount of people coming through the town. The, just the importance of the Bush Nursing Centre, I guess, in town. It's just a fantastic service to have, just in a small town 
like heroin, like I said, the quality and the um, of trained nurses and what they're able to do and the services that come, doctors and all sorts of things is quite amazing. It's always been quite a young community as well, which you don't find very often in small farming areas. Yeah, just such a young and, and vibrant community and yeah, there's always, just always events going on, always ideas coming up of ways to get people into town. It's, um, yeah, it's quite amazing really. And you know, you don't know where you, wherever you go and you say you come from Harrow, there's people go, oh yeah, there's this goes on or, you know, the big blokes or the sound and light show or there's always something that someone's been to in Harrow that, that um, they remember and yeah. Went to a friend's wedding and met Heath at the wedding in Western Australia. He'd been over there for about seven years over in Western Australia. Um, and But at that stage, I'd already committed to the Swedish family that I'd go back for a 12-month period. So I uh, headed back to Sweden for the 12 months and we just um, did the phone calls to and from. And, yeah, and we just thought, well, after the 12-month period, if we're still um, together and we still want to be together, then... Um, I guess that um, was meant to be, and I guess now that I've been here the last 14 years, I guess it's <laughs> that's the reason why I come back. Yeah. There's still plenty of places to see, of course. There's never en it's never ending, but um, but yeah, I think now that, now that I'm settled with my own family, um, it's certainly made a difference, and I guess wherever Heath and the kids, are, kids go, I'll <laughs> is where I'll, I'll be. But One particular expression David loved, which my mother used at times, when in doubt, take the masterful course and do nothing. <laughs> it's amazing how often the problem disappears. It's so, it's different today. It's so different, really. I mean, my father, really, I was not allowed to go out to a party by myself or with others. Uh, hence the party at Gull's Way, you know, which was a friend of ours and her um, granny, I think, gave her a party. It wasn't um, like going to the pub or something, you just didn't, and meeting people, you just, that wasn't in it then. Well, it was an absolute fluke that we actually got there because a friend, the friend had just rung me a minute ago, and she rang me and said, how are you getting down to this party down there? And I said, well, actually, I'm just sort of pondering it. <laughs> I don't I really know at this stage, and I'm, I've been thinking about who I could, you know, ring. David was suddenly desperate for a, um, some guidance to get him there. Anyway, his mother had always said, if you answer an invitation and say you're coming, you must do it. And um, so, in fear and trembling down, he went. So, I mean, it was really, it, almost both of us didn't get there, but then we did, and we met there. And um, I think probably we both knew um, inside ourselves that it was um, more than just a passing thing. Straight away, I'm sure I did. We only saw one another uh, three more times. In three weeks we were engaged. So there was letter writing. A lot of letter writing. <laughs> His spelling's not too good. <laughs> um, <laughs> whilst I was at Babama, which is down on the end of, was um, on the end of Southern end of Narendra. Um Yes, I, I lived a quite quiet life, but somebody said to me, oh, did you find it lonely? But I just hadn't got into the community, and probably because of my fairly closed upbringing, I just hadn't. And then, of course, when the babies came, well, I mean, and Kate and Richard were such live wires, you couldn't take them anyway. <laughs> well, no, don't put that in, please. <laughs> please, 
think, anyway, when I came up here, the children by that stage were at the, the Harrow School, and so needless to say, I was in and out, in and out, and then you meet other mothers, and then of course you're invited to join the Mother's Club, and then you become part of that and its committee and so on, and then the Red Cross, and uh, you know, and you name it, next thing, you're deeply involved, and what a good thing, you know, it's great. <laughs> I guess from being brought up in a small community over in WA, it just has that same feeling to it. It has that, you know, and just that, um, you know, just in, I just enjoy being a part of the community and getting involved, and it's just a great place to to um, bring up kids, I guess. Yeah, it's just a nice, nice feeling to um, be a part of the community. Yeah. The community in Harrow is fantastic. Like you've got people in the community are just a very, they've got this very strong bond and they're able to pull together and just, just do things and get things done. There was a flood here in um, Harrow a couple of years ago and I was working up near Edenhope and I'd run out of dry sheep and I thought I'd call through and have a look at because I'd never seen the river really high and some of the locals had started sandbagging. So I stayed and helped and gave a hand and there was just, people came from like all in the district and they're down and it was hot. It was very hot and it was steamy and everyone was on shovels and dragon bags around and stuff just to save the little community, to just keep the water out of it. It's got to survive. Harrow has to survive and I think this is why so much has been done. There have been the people in it, in the community, who've had the vision and wanted to try and do something and keep keep the place going. It, it is hard, isn't it, when you look at Harrow and where it is, not on the main road, to make people understand. But I don't think um, I would have had the same opportunity or the same motivation, shall I say, if I were living in Melbourne, I think it's much, much harder to become part of a community in the same way. Little towns present those opportunities if you want to take them. I've had opportunities which I never would have had in the city, I'm sure, um, to do things and be involved in amazing sort of projects. Um, and so it's, to me, it's, it's um, I need the town, the town, maybe I can help it a bit. Mm. And it's, it, I, I'm personally, and I know David is too, you know, we're passionate about doing, we haven't got the steam that we had, but passionate about getting, keeping the town going. Because what would we do without it?
think there's a lot of hidden stuff here. When you look at the census, it's 94 people live in Harrow, but I can tell you there's way more than 94 people. It's just that they're all a lot out on farms and things like that. So towns like this bring all those people from all those different areas together. You sort of share everything and it's... Um, I've got, a, I think, a better education here than I had in Melbourne just because I've got access one-on-one -on -one to these amazing talents and, and my kids get to do amazing things. They've been out landmarking and riding motorbikes and, and they just, it, yeah, it's a, it's a fun, fun way to be and it's important um, for people to feel like they're part of something, I think, and they enjoy it here. It, it, yeah, you feel like you're part of a family. I know it sounds a little daggy, but you do actually feel like you're part of something more. Well, Pathways has been the most wonderful experience, I think, for all of us who've taken part. Um, last year we were the trailblazers. <laughs> and I, it, was, it was quite a daunting task in many ways, but I think the Heritage Nursing Centre has been absolutely wonderful. The girls have been marvellous. They've dedicated so much time to it. And I'm pleased to say that they've been able we are never by ourselves. We are never bored, and it's uh, it's uh, it's just so so beautiful to to, to co con contri contribute to the little town and the little community as Harrow. Yeah, as we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm like I've, I've been here for 35 years, and uh, yeah, I did miss my family a, a lot when I came here. But now I just feel this is my family. This is my home, and. <laughs> And I just love the country and love the people and and my children's grown up here. I have grandchildren, so yeah, yeah, I love Australia. <laughs> yes, yes. Thanks very much. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.